All right. Um, I have a word I want to share. It's, last week we talked a little bit about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how they stood up when they were set up to worship the, the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had put in place. He invited people to a dedication and then he uh, double-crossed them with a worship service to a statue in his honor. I don't know that they attended knowing that, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were required to go. And uh, I suspect that maybe Daniel was their mentor and he wasn't there. Perhaps he was out on business, I don't know. But at any rate, they found themselves standing and the three of them stood together and did not bow down in worship. And how the world is always puts us in situations where if we're not ready in our confidence in God, we will be exposed. And so those are opportunities where we find out really how our walk with the Lord is. And um, in, in doing that and coming into what I want to share today, I really feel like the Lord's given me a key that is really a valuable key uh, and something I didn't fully appreciate until he took me through my study. And I want to read this verse in Romans 15, 17 through 19. It's the Apostle Paul speaking. This verse convicted me this week in my readings. And it's, Paul says, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. So I have reason. Paul's saying, I have reasons to, to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word or deed. So the Apostle Paul said that I, I will not promote the things of God that haven't taken place in me. Now, I don't think he was saying, because everybody preaches beyond their experiences. We dabble, we get some revelation, and we declare it, and we ought to, and we grow into those things. I don't think he was saying, so until you've experienced God, you have nothing to say. But at the same time, he was promoting such a significant gospel, and he was saying, this has worked in me. So I'm not just giving you theory. I'm giving you practical um, evidence. And then it says, to make the Gentiles obedient, to call them into formation. And it says, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about um, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Well, that just kind of really got to me this week when I read that verse. I will dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed. And I, I just think that this, this is a guy who really didn't agree to the truth. He lived in the power of the truth. Now, just thinking about the Apostle Paul real quick. We can think that he was determined, that he had strength of fortitude, that he had a spiritual mightiness and a spiritual effectiveness. And then we can think about how much we owe him. And then we can get to the point where we just think, this was a guy who's not like every other guy. Therefore, it, we have the Trinity, and then we have Paul, and then we have the rest of us. And we're just thinking, we'll never be like him. But that isn't what he was saying. He was saying, I preach what's working in me so that you can know it'll work in you. So the truth is, even though our callings may be different, we all have the ability in us to live a life like the Apostle Paul. Now, we can agree with that, but tell me something that will enable me to actually do that, because I really do think that there is, uh, there is something that we need to discover that we can do that. One of the things that Leela had also said was, we just can't produce this stuff on our own. You know, you've heard the sermons that end up really saying, try harder, do better, get with it. And if we don't hear correctly, we're, we're not, it's not an invitation to what's available to us. It's really a command to get your life right so that you can start benefiting from the things that God has for you. And if they aren't working in you, that's evidence that you aren't trying hard enough. We, that is like the, the myth that runs in everybody's head. And if we don't directly address that, we, we end up hearing things like that. So let me, just, let me just really unpack Paul just for a little bit. We studied him this last semester, and it was good. And that um, 
if you study Paul, you'll notice that he lived a very culturally paradoxical life, meaning he, he lived in the culture, but he really wasn't of the culture, and he didn't live by the rules of the culture, and it caused a lot of issues from the, from the observation seat of the culture. For instance, it, um, it, Paul A.J. Williams commented out of a book that we read, he brought up this week, this, this thought, by God's standards, Paul's life was accompanied by great glory. Would you agree with that? But by man's standards, Paul's life was marked by weakness and suffering. He was an ambassador for God. Now, have you ever met a real ambassador of a nation? Neither have I. But however, if we did, they, would, they wouldn't be driving a car like I'm driving. They probably wouldn't be wearing clothes like I'm wearing. They wouldn't live in a house like I live in. They would, there wouldn't be anything that we would really relate to. They would be treated by the finances of the nation that sponsors them, and the nation that sponsors them has authorized them to speak and look like the nation that's sending them. Put it on your best presentation and be impressive. That's the idea of an ambassador. You represent the nation. Well, the Apostle Paul represented as an ambassador of Christ the kingdom of God, and he was in prison, he was shipwrecked, he was stolen from, he was beaten, he was lied about. He didn't project the image of an ambassador. And he said, by the standards of the world, I, I live in chronic weakness and um, disapproval and lies and misrepresentations. But by God's standards, I actually live in the power of the resurrection where even handkerchiefs have brought healing to people. My shadow has brought healing. My word has changed a culture that when I spent time in Ephesus, I literally was able to empower the people to bring down the demonic stronghold over that part of Asia. And we changed the culture. By God's standards, God's glory attends to me. But if you use the world standards to measure me by, yeah, I come up really weak. So we have to decide then, how do we see what God's trying to do and what is he trying to do? Now, Paul says that he was accompanied by weakness. That is, you know, he talks about that. So it wasn't a lack of influence because he was very influential. Uh, you and I are even evidence of that. His influence is still going. It couldn't be a lack of revelation of God's plans or ways, right? Because two-thirds of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul, given us instruction. It definitely wasn't a lack of standing before world-renowned leaders. He preached before the king of Israel, the emperors of Rome, governors, the Sanhedrin, Roman centurion, and guards. From small to great, Paul stood before them all. However, he did it as a prisoner, but he did it, and he moved them when he spoke. Could it be lack of provision? Well, Paul said, I had needed nothing. How about physical health? You know, that's been a little debate. What was his thorn and all that stuff? Well, listen to the, you know, when he was on the Isle of Malta and a snake bit him and he shook it into the fire, is that the way a person behaves who is fearful of sickness or snake bites or anything like that? It was nothing to him. He got bit, he shook it off, kept going about his business while people waited for him to die. But he never did. Um, did he lack spiritual authority? Well, he commanded demons to come out of people, and he was able to bring regions to demo free from the demonic strongholds. He didn't lack spiritual power. He quickly forgot, or we quickly forget, his miracle-empowered napkins and handkerchiefs that miraculously set people free. So, if, if Paul says... I, there, there was a suffering and a weakness about me. What is it? I ask these questions. Was it lack of family approval? Was it lack of influence among his peers? Was it a lack of earthly comforts? Was it a lack of worldly authority and power? Well, the answer is yes. He lacked all those things. He lacked family approval. He lacked uh, influence among his peers. He lacked earthly comforts. And he lacked world authority and power. He was a prisoner. He wasn't a free man many, much of the time of his life. 
So Paul discovered he couldn't always bring his earthly leverage with him, but that didn't mean he couldn't be triumphant, victorious, a conqueror, and amazingly blessed in all things. It simply meant that the strategies and promises of this world fall short of the strategies and promises of God. And I don't bring that up to just say, okay, fine. What I want to discover is how did Paul then make the move to live in the reality of the kingdom of God and be absolutely at peace with that and let go of the things of the world and be absolutely at peace with that. And I don't think it was he was a better man than you or me. I don't think that's what it was. I think it was he discovered the riches of God that were at work in him, and when he discovered those, he said, I'm going to live in that resource rather than the one that's around me. So I want to discover what that is. And uh, <clears throat> even, even John says, you know, you can't love the world and seek first the kingdom of God. You can't take the world with you. You're going to have to decide what is God's plan and sell out to it. And he may bless you and he will bless you and you will be more than a conqueror. You will be triumphant in the terms of God's glory, not always in the terms of securing the comforts and benefits of this world. So... When Paul said, he goes, I, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, so you follow me as I follow Christ. So he must know something that we ought to know. Okay, so now I want you to, I'm going to bring it up, Isaiah 11, 1 through 4. <clears throat> now this is Isaiah prophesying about Jesus. And herein is the secret discovery that you probably, most, maybe half of you know it, but uh, it just nickel dropped for me this uh, recently. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is speaking of Jesus. Um, And he shall bear fruit. Okay, and then verse 2, and then this is what it says of him. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And then the next verses tell us what are the facets of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of wisdom the spirit and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, let's look at that. So, how many have ever asked the Lord, Lord, I need wisdom in this situation. Would you pray and ask, give me wisdom? And the Lord gives you the wisdom on how to handle a situation, right? Or have you ever asked for understanding? Like, Lord, help me understand what's going on in does. Or the spirit of counsel. If you've done any pastoring of sorts and all of a sudden you find yourself saying things like, wow, I, that didn't come from me. That was the Lord giving counsel to that in that situation. Or a spirit of might where you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's a work of the Holy Spirit, right? We would attribute that. Spirit of knowledge. Do you know that the true knowledge that God wants us to get out of here is a work of the Holy Spirit? Is that right? There are people that have read this. Just turn to the fiction channel, and they'll tell you everything about the Bible, and they don't know the Lord if he was standing in front of them. They don't have any revelation at all because there isn't any work of the Spirit in them. They're intellectually brilliant, perhaps, though I'm not convinced, but they, they, they have knowledge. They just don't have the right kind of knowledge. They don't have the knowledge that comes from the work of the Spirit. And then it says, and the fear of the Lord. And here's, here's my sense of what I want to propose. The fear of the Lord is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in you. It is a work of the Holy Spirit, not a work of your own determination that I will fear the Lord, but it is a product of the work of the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 3, his delight, this is speaking of Jesus, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by what he, his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Um, next one, if we have it. Do we have it? <clears throat> But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. 
Now, that last portion there, uh, we start out with this first ministry of Jesus where he comes, and then the second portion of his ministry is coming where he's going to reclaim the earth. He's going to come and make his presence known. But and in order for us to understand that, how many know that we need the Holy Spirit to reveal what, what, are, what are you really saying here? Now, then once we know that, we need, so Lord, help me understand what you're doing here. And then, Lord, help me to have wisdom on how to work with you so that I, I, set, I set myself up for a fruitful future. And then, Lord, I... Uh, in the midst of that, there should be comfort and counsel should be taking place. And so, Lord, what is it? Well, if I think the sense of it is, is if I can understand the working of the Holy Spirit that brings in me the fear of the Lord, then all these things will be woven together and make sense for me. Proverbs, or Psalms 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 14.27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And then Proverbs 15.33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. Now, if you're like me, the idea of the fear of the Lord is this, is this sense of, I better discover that I should be terrified of God, and then that will motivate me to live right. I don't know if you've wrestled with that, but my thought of the fear of the Lord is, if I knew that God could cast me into hellfire, then I would start living right. And you need to make it very clear the cost of sin you need to understand the cost of sin. So once you do, maybe you'll fear God and live right. I mean, that's kind of the sense of it. At least that's the one I live with. <laughs> it's this, okay, I know I'm doing bad. I hope God's not watching. And if he is, I hope he's really merciful and patient and loving and kind and gentle and forbearing and all that because that's what I need right now because I'm not actually living right, so therefore I'm not really fearing God and if, and if you don't fear the Lord, you're go where, what direction are you going to go? There's that sense of that. I don't think that's the fear of the Lord. That I do think those living right is a product of the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is not something I muster up. It is a part of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it has great benefits to it that I want to discover. So, it is a work of the Holy Spirit, just like revealed knowledge, understanding, wisdom, counsel, spiritual strength. It is not a product, I want to propose this, the fear of the Lord is not a product of human effort or works. It is the answer of the Holy Spirit to a person's desire for more of Him. The fear of the Lord is an answer to my desire to have more of God's presence, the more of his fullness working in me. That's my proposal to you. Ephesians 3.19, that Paul prays and pleads with the Father that we, the saints, may be filled with all the fullness of God, that the Holy Spirit would work a stretching in our hearts and soul, enlarging us and filling us with the Holy Spirit and thereby increasing us in the fear of the Lord. Now, I'm going to propose some verses that I want to see the benefits of the fear of the Lord. Acts 2.43. This is shortly after Pentecost, and, and uh, they, the church had grown mightily, and things were beginning to work. And it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So when the fear of the Lord started coming upon the church, it released signs and wonders. I wonder if there's a connection. Acts 5, 5 and verses 11 through 12. This is, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So Ananias and Sapphira, that's when they were lying to the Holy Spirit. So I, I propose that the fear of the Lord was not working in Ananias and Sapphira. But not because they got killed. 
and hopefully I'll explain that in a minute. And it says, and hearing these words fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And then a little bit later it says, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were uh, all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So again, when we have the fear of the Lord working in the midst of the church, signs and wonders are accompanying that. Let's go back to the Apostle Paul where he says, I dare not talk about stuff that God hasn't done in me in word and deed and with signs and wonders. And Paul had the same spirit upon him that Jesus did, which part of that ministry of the Holy Spirit was the fear of the Lord. And Jesus carried it to where he says his delight was in the fear of the Lord. So then, <clears throat> Acts 9.31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they multiplied. So here we have the fear of the Lord is coupled with peace, edification, and comfort. Is a, is the fear of the Lord is connected to those things. Peace, edification, and comfort. Just a couple more. Acts 19, 17, in the New Living Translation. Acts 19 is that place where Paul uh, the, <clears throat> is doing great signs and wonders. And he's teaching daily in the school of Tyrannius. And then the, there, he was casting out demons. And so these seven sons, Jewish sons, decided they were going to try casting out a demon in Jesus' name. And it didn't work. And then uh, that the, the that testimony went around and then Paul kept preaching and it came to the point where um, that it says that they came and they burned all their occult books they gave glory to God and the word of God prevailed and the and the region was changed well in this just prior right after the guys got beat up trying to cast out the spirit it says the story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike a solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. In the message, it says, the realization spread that God was in and behind this. The fear of the Lord is this sense of, I am so persuaded in who God is, what he's done, what he's doing, that it gives me a perspective on everything else. That the fear of God is such an eye-opening look into the awesomeness of God <clears throat> that everything else, circumstance, my situation, the suffering for the Lord, um, being maligned, ridiculed, everything else, I have perspective on that now. God is so great that all this pales by comparison. I will no longer hold on to that. I will hold on to the Lord. You picture Jesus walking around. I mean, you know, he knew who he was. He was the one. Didn't sin. He was the reflection of the Father. Really, he was the evidence of the Father. And he lived. And when he comes to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees come and say, you are not the Son of God, because we got it right here. This is what the Son of God looks like. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're not the Son of God. Jesus had perspective. He could look at them and just say, his delight was the fear of the Lord. I've seen the Lord. And he, it is so branding on my soul that you cannot change that. And so he just continued on walking the way he was walking. He never got pulled out, sucked out, talked out, diverted out of his assignment or his mission. He was moved by this vision he had of the Father which brought into him such a branding of presence, and that, that is what is called the fear of the Lord. It's not, the, it's not a terror where I'm like, it does include that. I'm not, I'm not even trying to redefine the word. It, but it's this terror that brings peace because once I'm in Christ, I no longer fear him in a tormenting way. 
I just so honor and respect him so much, nothing else affronts me. It's the fear of the Lord. <coughs> We're going to start a series next week on the book of Revelation, and I'm very excited about it. <coughs> Mostly because I don't have a clue what it's actually saying. <laughs> but I know who it's talking about. It really is a book about revealing Jesus. I mean, that's really what it is. And just how everything around Jesus and everything that's going on in heaven right now is worship. And every commission that comes out of heaven is preceded by worship around the throne. And when we worship on earth, we get in line with what the throne is doing and we are in concert with what God is doing. And if, the, and if the church comes to the point where we together carry the fear of the Lord, we will literally live within the comfort and edification and peace of God while he is reclaiming and delivering the earth from demonic stronghold. That really is what Revelation is doing. He is casting out the devil out of the earth. I got a couple of verses that I want to share real quick. Um, this is Jesus in his personal ministry. In Luke 4, it says, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. I like that. Let us alone. A demon, let us alone. We have, uh, what we have, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst and was tearing at him, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then all who were, then they all were amazed and spoke among them, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding areas. So when Jesus cast the spirit out of the person, there was a manifestation and that person was convulsed, and the spirit came out, and he was well, and he wasn't hurt in the end. Another place in Luke 4, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick and various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. And then Luke 9, 42, I think we have that one. <clears throat> and it says, as he was still coming, while he was still coming, the demon threw this person to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. Now the result of this happening was when people saw that, they literally got perspective. Jesus was more, had more authority and demonstrated more power of God than the devils did. And they ended up saying, you're better, we're going to align with you. The idea of the, the, the fear of the Lord is recognizing that he is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. And it puts me in his camp and gives me perspective on the situation. Now, what's interesting to me is I think these verses are like a, a micro look at what God is going to do on a macro scale when it comes to delivering the earth from demonic entities in the last days. There will be great upheaval and convulsing and great tearing that's taking place. But in the end, <clears throat> we know that the world is going to be totally healed into this wonderful paradise <clears throat> that it was always intended to be. Those who fear the Lord will have perspective on this and will align themselves to, to what God is doing rather than go to war against God when he's doing it. <clears throat> and it's the whole point of the Lord. This is water, so it just looks like coffee, but it's water. <clears throat> As they say, it keeps your sermons from being dry. Yeah. <clears throat> so, 
So the fear of the Lord is, this, is, what, is what helps me see what God's doing. It helps me to know what he's doing, understand what he's doing, has, have wisdom with what he's doing. It brings a, a comfort in, in to me. It brings counsel to me. One of the other words that some of the older writers threw in there was holiness, that, the, that it was also there was a sense of the spirit of holiness. But all this was linked and worked with the fear of the Lord is what brought these things about. And the fear of the Lord is that I trust God to be strong enough to do the job. That's The fear of the Lord is I respect God's opinion over every other opinion. I honor God's conclusion over every other conclusion. I honor God's the strength of his right arm more than the strength of the world. I trust his financial system more than I trust the world's financial system. I trust his counsel. I trust his might. I trust his knowledge. I trust his understanding. I trust his wisdom more than I trust anything that the world offers me. I fear him. I honor him. I respect his word more than every other word. And as a result of that, when I align myself with God, then his kingdom comes in its fullness. And when the church was functioning in that, where they revered him and honored him and had perspective, they rejoiced when they persecuted because they saw the wisdom of God in that. They rejoiced when they went out and they laid hands on the sick and they were taken out into the streets and they did things and then there was a pushback. They got it. They knew what was going on. God was delivering their culture from demonic stronghold and it took confrontation. But they recognized God was doing that in them and that the outcome was going to be worth it no matter what because God's smarter than the world and the end result will be God's result. That's what happened in the early church. It's what's to continue to happen and it comes to a climax at the end of the age. But the end result is God gets back everything and he does it perfectly and it will literally, all creation is standing And there's tons of entities around the throne right now worshiping God, recognizing you're the wisest, most knowledgeable, most brilliant being there is. We can't say that enough about you as they're aligned around the throne. So the fear of the Lord then, as I said, is not a product of human effort. And I really want to say, aren't you glad about that? It is God answering uh, your desire. It is a revelation sought by you and me and brought by the Holy Spirit. He brings, in other words, I have to say, Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just as I want to to know what your will is, to understand my circumstances, to know what I ought to do, wisdom, that I want the strength in me to do it. And I want the counsel that comes with me having a sense of why this is. I want you to grant me the fear of the Lord so I trust you in this more than I trust anything I see. Give me perspective on what you're doing. The fear of the Lord. And that's a work of the Holy Spirit, and I believe we're to ask for it. Now, I want to do, I do want to propose this because I realized I was sharing this with the interns. I try it out on them and see what happens. And if anybody, lo- any of them lose their salvation, then I can it. But <laughs> Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. He was saying that in, in reference to, I'm going to divide families. Right? I mean... When I first got saved and I talked to my family, it didn't go very well. He, I come, and he didn't say, I've come to, to divide families. He says, when you see me for who I am and you choose me, it, it will bring conflict to your family. And you're going to have to decide. Do you have my perspective and trust it? Or are you going to take their perspective and trust it? Now, I know that there's conflict there. When, when we ask people, and Paul, talking to Timothy, and, and, and we have idea that Timothy had the approval of, or 
Paul had the approval of Timothy's mother and grandmother, but he was, he was literally inviting him to martyrdom. I invite you to stay put even if it takes your life. How could you ask somebody to do that? Only by the fear of the Lord, where I have God's perspective on this. And I value it more than any other perspective. And when I value God's perspective, I am then, I have access to all the other attributes of God. If I cower in what God's asking and run to any other resource, I have forfeited the one God makes available to me. That's why Jesus' delight was in the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is one of these things. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. I should ask for it. Fill me with the fear of the Lord, Lord. Do that for me. What can it bring? It can bring conflict. I really believe it can. But at the same time, it brings a, it brings a kind of conflict that... Um, brings the kingdom of God about because there will always be a tearing when God is repossessing things that have been taken from him. So we just have to get comfortable with the fact that we are on mission and the world is going to push back on us and the world shows up in many places, including the church, and that that point of perspective is at odds with the kingdom of God and those who fear the Lord will weather it. Right? How are we doing? This really is good news, I guess. <laughs> it really is good news. I think it's really a work of what God's doing mightily right now. I want to propose this. And I don't, this, this is just a truth. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And I've used this analogy. The Father loves. The Son forgives. And the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He won't force himself upon anybody. You have to want him to do the work of bringing about the fear of the Lord in your life. You have to consider the fact that when he does, that you are now at conflict with the kingdom of darkness and every place it has a hold. It, it will force that to happen. Why? Because the fear of the Lord will come upon you at inconvenient times and say, I've appointed you to, to bring the truth to that person right now. Well, Lord, they're my friend and they don't really know that I'm a Christian. Well, I want to give you perspective. I'm doing something, and you've said yes to me. Now move. If I don't have the fear of the Lord, I'll negotiate that. But if I have the fear of the Lord, I surrender to it because I trust his ways better than my way. And then I just make a move on it. And what happens if I'm alienated? I just trust, God, your way is better than my way. And in the end, the chances are you'll actually gain a friend who will thank you for having the courage to testify about the truth. Because if you don't, someone else will, and then they'll get mad at you for not speaking up, because how could you have been my friend and never say anything to me? Anybody ever have that happen? So the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will come if we want him to. Now, I believe that the fear of the Lord is a place of joy. It's a place of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Because if the Holy Spirit is coming and doing this ministry, he brings with it all the attributes of the, of the fruitfulness of his life. So when I am functioning in the fear of the Lord, it's I can rejoice, I can have joy, I can be thankful, I can, I, I can be patient, I can, I can tolerate things because I recognize his way is the best way and I'm willing to surrender to it. That's the fear of the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> I wrote this paragraph, don't even know what it says, let me read it. We often live by the assumed but wrong principle that if God wants me to know something, he will make it known. We often live by the assumed but wrong principle that if God wants me to know something, he will make it known. The truth is, if God wants me to know something, he'll tell it, but he won't long compete with me, my excuses, or my cares and fears for this world. 
The Holy Spirit can be grieved. He can be put on the back shelf. He will allow himself to be resigned to that. In the sense, not easily, and I'm not, he's, not a, he's not a wimp or anything like that. It's just, he watches your heart. If Lord, I hunger for you. I want you to help me. I need this, Lord. I don't get this. All these fears are going on in my life right now, and I don't know where you are, and I don't know what's going on, and why you aren't doing something about this. That's an evidence that my perspective is not really in line with what God's doing. I need perspective, Lord. Give me a vision of who you are. I embrace you. I want you to reveal yourself to me. Reset me in the sense of the fear of the Lord. Do that work in me. I need that. I, I want it. And he will do that. He'll answer that because he, he's not deaf. <laughs> he, just, he just, but if you don't want it, well, one of the things I'm going to share about a little bit is right now our culture claims to be Christian but has no fear of the Lord. We don't fear the Lord at all in our culture. Therefore, we got nothing going on and we don't have perspective. In fact, we, are, we think we have tamed God. That is the opposite of the fear of the Lord. And when he starts drawing near, just Jesus walking into the room caused demonic, demon, demonized people to act up. When he draws near, the earth will respond and convulse. And he basically is saying, I am who I say I am, and all the world's going to know it. And those who align themselves with it can live in peace and comfort and joy and all that. And those who don't will be, will be being torn until they respond to me. And that's where, what's happening. These are exciting times. But they're not exciting and they don't sound very exciting if I don't have perspective. And fear of the Lord gives me that. Are we good? Good. All right. I'm done with that. You either heard me or you didn't. I... <laughs> We're going to receive communion. And uh, I'm going to ask that that elements come on up and be passed out. We have two trays. One tray is the remaining cups that have the little wafer in it and the package. I don't know which side it's going to land on, but one side of you is going to get that. The other side is going to get actual grape juice with a plate, a cracker plate. Okay. So we'll uh, sort of like, it's not like sheep and goats, but we'll just see what happens. <laughs> Jesus said, if you don't partake of me, you have none of me. I mean, and we got that. We get that, that, that he's saying, you don't, you don't get to put Jesus in your pocket and pretend you have him. He, he's either, he's Lord. And the, the issue is lordship. It's not salvation. He's either, he's either stepped into the throne of your life to give you a proper orientation or you're still at that place and he's working with you. Well, but the other side of it is, Lord, I want to partake of the fullness of your Holy Spirit too. Bring your fullness to me. I need it. I need to see, I need to know, I need to have perspective. These are, these are great days. These are the things, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is what causes me to move in faith. Because I believe that that circumstance does not trump what God said. That's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord causes me to move confidently in the promises of God. If I fear my circumstances, I'll contend with God rather than move in faith and confidence with God. The, the fear of the Lord, the, the lack of the fear of the Lord, makes God small and makes my problem big. But the fear of the Lord gives perspective. It puts my problem under God's feet and makes him the great Savior and Lord that he is. And so the fear of the Lord is this wonderful work of God, and with it, I'm sure, as we get a glimpse of who he is, it causes us to bow and put our face in the ground and look for the lowest spot we can in the room. And it's both a delight and a terror at the same time. Well, the Lord's coming. Come, come on up, guys. And So I invite you to receive communion. Um, and what I'm going to ask us to do is you just take it. And when you're ready, you have a moment with the Lord, okay? You take a moment with the Lord and you have this conversation with him about you wanting to really get his perspective and the Bible just plainly calls it the fear of the Lord, that we would want the fear of the Lord.